and welcome to everybody. I uh, know that we've got people from all over Australia and I also believe we have quite a few joining us from New Zealand today. So uh, welcome to you all. It's lovely to be able to chat to you. <clears throat> um, it's unfortunate it's in these quite difficult times. And, uh, I'm hoping that you're all managing to adapt uh, one degree or another. Um, so this morning I do want to talk about um, some techniques that we can use if you're continuing to practice in uh, dentistry. And I suppose that what I will do is if this is in the Australian context and, and for those uh, in New Zealand, I, I really can't comment on your regulations at present. There are some differences between the two countries. So um, I will be commenting based on the Australian uh, state at present. Uh, but there's a lot of this you'll be able to relate to your own practices in New Zealand as well. Um, I do want to thank GC enormously for facilitating all of this and make, making this all work um, because I think it's important that we all try and keep in touch in, in what are quite trying times for many of us in practice. Um, so I, I guess that historically I think we need to look at the, the last 10 days have been quite interesting for us all. Um, in Australia at least back on 27th of March our AH Double PC, the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee um, determined that dentistry would need to change the way it operates and took on the Australian Dental Association guidelines on dental treatment. Um, the following day, the Dental Board of Australia republished that advice and then made it mandatory that um, dentists, if they were continuing to practice dentistry, followed those guidelines. Uh, I think it is important that you understand what those guidelines are uh, and that you follow those. Um, and ultimately, as an individual practitioner, you've got to apply your own clinical and professional judgment on a case by case basis on what you're going to do for individual patients. Um, unfortunately, there have been um, a lot more regulatory people around and I think some of our boards are a little bit tougher these days, but um, there are penalties if you go outside those things. And, and while I don't want to be negative about this, it is important that we do um, take utmost precautions. So. If you're in New Zealand, uh, take the advice of the New Zealand Dental Association and your New Zealand Dental Council. But in Australia, it is really the, the Dental Board of Australia. So last week, the Dental Board of Australia did give an update and it did clearly state that it expects all dentists, oral health therapists, dental therapists, dental hygienists and dental prosthetists to follow those AHPC recommendations and apply them to their practice settings. Um, the Dental Board is the regulator in Australia and they are taking advice from other professional bodies such as the ADA and the colleagues, the Royal Australasian College of Dental Surgeons and some other uh, professional associations as well. The ADA has provided a huge number of resources uh, up until just late last week. Um, they had a full campaign COVID website available. Um, that's now been totally reformatted and the ADA webpage has been reformatted to um, uh, COVID-19 portal and when you access that um, there are two portals one for dental professionals and one for the public. Now these are freely available to everybody you no longer need or you, you don't need to be an ADA member to access these um, so if you are even in uh, the uh, New Zealand you can still access some of these things and, and basically uh, ensure that you get the most up-to-date information. Um, I, I won't spend a lot of time on these, but I think it is important that you understand that there are some very useful guidelines there. Um, in Australia, we're at level three restrictions. Um, and I think everybody has basically read those through, through those restrictions and know what we can do. But in summary, it is for dentists to continue to operate, they will be doing treatment that is considered urgent or emergency um, and only dental treatments that do not generate aerosols. And I'll go into detail on some of those things and some of the techniques that we can use. Obviously, the focus of this discussion today is around atraumatic restorative treatments um, and how they can be a very useful adjunct to your clinical practice and how you can implement those into your clinical practice currently. But I guess the big thing is to remember that you should be deferring all routine examinations and cleanings, certainly not starting any new crown and bridge, dentures, implants, endodontics, unless it's essential. Um, and certainly reconsider extractions of teeth because one of the issues around extractions is you don't particularly want them to turn into a surgical. If it's a simple enough extraction, fine, it's a good option and can be go, can go ahead, but we want to try and avoid any complex situations. Um, if we move on to level four and level five restrictions, that really is going to limit what practices can do. There are a number of practices that have already decided that they're going to close down and that it's too difficult for them to operate and that's fine as well. There are no judgments being made. In Australia late last week, uh, the ADA sent an email around to all members 
asking them to notify whether they were going to keep their practice open or closed. Um, ADA is now keeping a register of all those practices that are open. Um, I know that probably doesn't help those of you in New Zealand, but certainly uh, in Australia, if you're looking to find someone in your local area that is continuing to work um, and you can direct patients to, then this is a very useful resource. Um, if you are going to close your practice, again, there's no concerns with that. Um, but I, I think there are some things you can do to sort of help your patients. Um, one of the things that you could initially do is provide emergency contact numbers for your patients. And they can be to um, yourself for phone triaging or to other uh, practices who may be seeing your patients in that time. Um, there is the possibility of doing quite a few phone assessments of patients. I've done quite a few of these now just to sort of do a little bit of diagnosis over the phone. Um, and sometimes it might be simple pain relief or antibiotics where appropriate. Um, but I think you've just got to be careful that we don't uh, assume that we can find it everything on the, the phone. Teledentistry hasn't really got to the level that we can uh, do this uh, super efficiently, but it certainly helps and can be reassuring to some patients, particularly if they're sometimes more concerned and, and the issue isn't as pressing as we thought. But for some of the more urgent things that you can't deal with, um, general medical practitioners or hospitals may be able to provide some sustained pain relief or antibiotics if, if you feel it's necessary. Um, but ultimately, as I said, you're the clinician, uh, you're the registered practitioner, so you need to determine whether or not any care you provide to patients is appropriate, and it really will be based on the specific needs of the patient and the patient's overall health. Um, I think you must also be very clear that your practice is able to provide dental care safely for patients and also looks after your team members at the same time. Um, there are different presentations of the virus and COVID-19 in different parts of Australia and New Zealand. So I think you need to be aware of what's happening in your area. Um, you need to ensure you've got availability of uh, personal protective equipment and that can be at both the levels for those treating patients without signs of any infection and those that may be uh, already carriers. Um, generally, I think the recommendations is if you've got patients who are known carriers or infected with the virus, they should not be treated with your dental within your dental surgery. They should only be treated within public health units or hospitals where they have uh, full protective equipment. Consider also your environment, where you're working. Are you in a single practice? Are you in a, a group practice? Are you in a standalone building? Or are you in a, a larger um, medical or health centre? Um, and, and you need to consider the environment that you're working in as well. So there are a few things that are uh, case by case, which you'll need to exercise your own judgment with. Um, I think the resources, as I've said on the ADA website, are exceptionally useful in helping you work out some of those problems. And, and I will touch on a couple of the things that they've listed on their website. This is on the dental professionals page. I, I won't uh, talk about the public page at all, but there are some really good Q and A's, questions and answers, some, some frequently answered questions, asked questions sections. Um, and I'll just touch on a couple of them. Um, one of the ones that comes up very frequently is, can I complete treatment that I've already started? Uh, and I suppose the answer to that is yes, within reason. Um, if, if it's going to benefit the patient by completing the treatment uh, and prevent a further emergency or drama, then you should complete the treatment. Um, under the level three restrictions, you can't start new work. But for example, if you've done a crown prep, you've got a temporary on that, the crown's been made and it's ready to be inserted. Um, it may be in the best interest of the patient just to insert that crown rather than worry that the temporary is going to fail and the patient may end up with pain and discomfort. Um, but you shouldn't be starting new crowns. You shouldn't be, even if you've got in-office milling, you know, starting a new crown, particularly uh, for, for a patient that's got a small fracture or a, a planned crown should be deferred until a later time. Um, in terms of what instruments produce aerosols in dental practice, I think the most common one that people are going to talk about is the high-speed handpiece. Uh, although ultrasonic cleaners, um, lasers, microabrasion, prophylaxis jets, um, certainly going to create big um, aerosols. Uh, also, your slow-speed handpieces, if you run them fast enough in the presence of water and saliva, can also create aerosols. So we need to be aware of that. Um, I will talk a little bit about how we can reduce aerosols when I get to some of the clinical scenarios as well. But it, it really, these level three restrictions are about aerosol reduction. Um, some other things, do you have to use rubber dam? Um, look, ideally that's the best way to do treatment and I will run through how you can do that to be very effective. Uh, but isolation is the key issue there. 
Um, rubber dam can be single tooth, quadrants, even split dams will work very effectively in reducing contamination and potential cross infection. Um, if you are doing phone consultations, uh, there isn't an item number currently for phone consultations. I know this is not really relevant for our New Zealand participants, but in Australia where we're very much um, and uh, using the schedule of uh, item numbers. Um, phone consultations tend to be something that, yes, if you want to, you can charge for. There is no item number attached for that. But if you are going to charge for a phone consultation, I would recommend that you get the patient's informed financial consent before you start. Tell them that there's going to be a fee and make sure that you document what was said on the phone call and include that in your records for completeness. Um, so again, lots and lots of resources and downloadable documents on the ADA website. Uh, um, lots of practice expectations and examples, and I'll run through some of those. There are treatment guidelines, how to triage and care for your patients, and some practice policies. Again, I haven't got time to go through all of these, but I do recommend that you go to that uh, COVID-19 portal and have a look at some of those. Um, you can get posters for your practice, and these will help um, maybe advising patients. Uh, one of the issues that we want to talk about getting patients into your practice is that you don't want them sitting in your waiting room. So I'm not encouraging you to get these in there and having the patients read them, possibly facing outside if you've got windows or doors on your practice so they can read that before they enter. Um, one of the big things that we are suggesting is if you are going to see a patient, you have them wait in their car or wait outside until you're ready to see them and the surgery is set up and you can call them so that they um, go straight into the surgery and they don't have to sit in the waiting room because there are probably some greater risks sometimes sitting in the waiting room than actually work, than having treatment undertaken in the clinic. There is a lot of information on infection control and precautions. And again, I'm not going to touch on this. Uh, Laurie Walsh has done some really good videos which are also available on the ADA website. And there's a lot of information about that. Um, I'm happy to touch on this if people really want to ask, but I, I think that this stage, it's a whole topic in itself, and I think we can leave that to other experts. Um, but there's some good resources on, on, on masks, which, when to use them and how to fit check them. And I think I, I'd really encourage you to look at those and just update yourself on the current knowledge so that you're really comfortable what you're doing. So if we're deciding to go ahead and treat some patients, that's great. Um, phone triaging can work a treat. Um, but how do you know whether you should treat that patient without looking in their mouth? Now, I, I think it's acknowledged that sometimes you will need to do a direct examination to make that decision. And, and that is allowed under level three restrictions. You can get the patient into your practice. You can examine their mouth and see what the concern is and decide on whether they're gonna have ongoing treatment. You are not gonna be doing a full assessment. It is a limited examination, focusing on the problem that they have, checking what they need to have done, and then deciding whether you continue at that point in time and treat the issue that they have, or whether you can let them go and defer them to a later date. Um, it is going to be something that you need to uh, take on board. Um, often the patients will be fairly demanding and want treatment, and certainly it's going to be up to you to determine what's best for that individual patient on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I think there's a fair bit of common sense involved with all of that. But here are a couple of scenarios I thought I'd put forward. These are also on the ADA website, so you can go back and refer to them. But often patients are going to present in quite intense pain, um, possibly irreversible pulpitis, spontaneous pain, that throbbing, aching, keeping them awake at night. Um, these are patients that you would be quite able to treat. And under the level three restrictions, yes, treat them. Um, you could be looking at either tooth removal or extirpation of the pulp to get rid of that uh, severe pulpitis. Uh, irreversible pulpitis. Um, but again, I would caution against taking the tooth out um, if it's anything but a very simple extraction because there is risk of fracturing root tips and you don't want to really be involved in uh, complex surgical extractions at this point in time. Um, I think removal of pulp, um, dressing the tooth, settling it down um, is probably the best option at this stage and planning the extraction to a later date when um, there's a little bit more control in our environment. Um, if you do decide to do some work, again, uh, there are some really basic things that we're all becoming aware of now. Using pre-procedural mouthwashes, and I'll go through those. Use of rubber dam isolation, particularly if you're doing any endodontic treatments. Um, then disinfecting the field that you're working in once the rubber dam is placed on. 
limiting your aerosol generating equipment, ensuring you use high volume evacuation close to the, the tooth and burr if you're going to be using a burr at all, um, and then using something which is going to protect the tooth rather than weaken it. Um, and I'm going to really talk a lot about glass onomers and the benefits you can get from them. But the current recommendation is to defer all completion of anodontics until after the pandemic is controlled. Um, uh, questions often asked about what if I'm in, in the middle of doing an endodontic procedure, should I complete it? The current recommendation is no, continue to dress and stabilise that and complete the endodontics after restrictions have been lifted. Um, the other case of pain that a patient may present with is um, more of the reversible pulpitis situation where the pain is maybe just a hot and cold but quite uncomfortable for the patient. Um, yes, you can still treat those patients, um, but you're minimising uh, pain that's ongoing. So again, the same things, pre-procedural mouth rinses, isolation with rubber dam, cleaning the field thoroughly, and then removing gross caries, uh, establishing sound margins and applying temporary materials. Um, it's not really recommended if you've diagnosed a reversible pulpitis to jump in and take pulps out. I think that we don't need to be aggressive. We need to maintain the patient as comfortable as possible um, and look at reviewing down the track. And I'm gonna talk about how we can use our ART dentistry, particularly for this type of patient um, as we go through uh, this presentation. Broken teeth, chipped teeth, fractured cusps, again, a common thing that patients present with as emergencies. Um, and if they ring or you have an assessment and say, yes, there's a fractured cusp, you can treat those patients. Um, I guess, again, the issue is whether you just smooth this over or whether you do a restoration. Uh, current recommendations are smooth over where possible and leave it till a later date, provided there's no risk to the tooth. Or place a temporary and repair the sharp edges so that you reduce any potential ulceration or sore spots. Um, it is not necessary to do the complete restoration if you feel you can place an adequate temporary because removal of this large amalgam would entail quite a bit of cutting with a high speed handpiece and potential for a lot of aerosols. Um, if you believe that you can isolate with rubber dam, if you believe that you can take that out without creating aerosols and the best op option for the patient is a permanent restoration, again that is still uh, possible but Currently recommendations are defer the permanent restoration until there's a bit more control of our pandemic. So decoronated, fractured tooth, apical lesions, are all good things to be aware of. And we know that some of these can be treated with antibiotics, but where you've got the fractured tooth and potential for recurring issues, um, yes, extraction may be possible. Um, definitely radiographs can still be taken using appropriate protocols. Um, and if you need to do the extraction, that's fine. But in a lot of cases, it may be better to dress this tooth and simply place some sort of root stump cap over the top of that, what I like to call bollard treatment, where we basically just protect that root surface and keep it out of strife, keep it functional, allow the patient to keep it clean until you can take that out at a later date. Um, there are some potential non-invasive techniques with the use of silver fluoride, and I will touch on those again as we go through this uh, short presentation. So I, I guess the general principles of all of this is that um, you're gonna make the determination whether you see the patient. Um, you should allow sufficient time. It will take you a little bit longer initially to sort of set your surgeries up, make sure everything's ideal. But at the same time, you wanna minimize the treatment time that the patient is within your surgery. Please move to using pre-procedural rinses. Use rubber dam wherever possible. Um, eliminate or minimize any aerosols um, and always use high-speed evacuation. There are a few other considerations that you might want to think about. Um, you can use alternating staff teams where you have uh, one, if you've got uh, multiple dentists in your practice and, and you want to keep the teams active, um, they could work alternating days or morning and afternoon, whatever is going to suit your, your system. It's a good way of ensuring you've got time to disinfect surgeries and you can move and keep the uh, surgeries clean, allowing time to wipe surfaces and decontaminate. Um, Definitely move into minimum intervention dentistry and I'm going to talk a lot about atraumatic restorative techniques. Trying not to use high speeds, using low speed hand pieces and hand instruments and really getting long term temporaries or interim restorations are going to keep the patient out of strife. So atraumatic restorative treatment is not a new concept. It's been around since the late 80s, early 90s and it is a very good concept which is still current today. Um, the basic premise behind atraumatic restorative treatment um, was originally based on areas that had no power, they had 
um, no access to hand pieces, and you could do caries removal and patient treatment um, under limited conditions. Um, I'm not suggesting that we're like that now, but what we are in is a situation where we're trying to limit aerosols and do very controlled dentistry and minimum intervention dentistry. So as such, ART is very applicable so that we do minimum intervention, minimum preparation. It will minimise the time you need to be have the patients in the uh, surgery. It also minimises the risk of cross-contamination and hopefully still maximises the outcomes for the patients. Um, as I mentioned, uh, originally this came out in the early 90s and, and just as a bit of a trivia here, the original manual for the atraumatic restorative treatment um, listed all the procedures and techniques that were available and how you do that. At that time, GC launched Fuji 9 uh, because it was requested for a material that would be most suitable and adhesive material most suitable. So many of you will know Fuji 9. Um, it was actually named after these nine aspects and stages in the ART technique. So a little bit of trivia for you. Um, but uh, I think I'm going to be talking about some, some newer materials as well today. Um, so having said it's been around for uh, 30 plus years, um, atraumatic restorative treatment is still current today. And Joe Franken, who was involved right back in the 90s, is in a few years ago in the British Dental Journal, wrote an updated uh, paper. Um, and he basically said he wanted to inform the reader that atraumatic care procedures should be given preference over rotary driven procedures. And this was quite interesting to have that reiterated um, in a period some nearly 30 years later. Um, and this review that came out just last year, um, atraumatic restorative treatment and interim therapeutic restorations are acceptable strategies with success rates comparable to traditional treatment methods. So if you're doing ART dentistry, it's not something left field. It is mainstream dentistry. It can be very effective. So please don't think you're giving your patients a second rate service during this uh, period of the, of the pandemic. Um, you can provide very good sound treatment for patients and following the appropriate ART techniques, you will find very good outcomes for your patients. So let's look at a couple of clinical examples and try and run through these. Um, obviously, let, let's talk about the painful tooth due to caries. Um, this is ideally adapted uh, for ART dentistry. Um, and I, I think there are a couple of terminologies I'll just point out. We talk about adapted ART dentistry and modified ART dentistry. And there are situations here where we can use hand pieces, we can use other technologies. We're assuming we've got lighting and access to materials, uh, not just hand mixed materials, but capsule mixed, et cetera. Um, when I was talking about the pre-procedural mouth rinses, um, there's three or four uh, po possible options here. Um, I think hydrogen peroxide is one of the most commonly used ones. We know that we can buy peroxide from the pharmacist at either a three or six percent solution, and it's very simple to dilute that down. And around about a one percent solution is very effective in neutralising the virus. Laurie Walsh, in a couple of his videos, has clearly pointed out that while the virus is quite aggressive and contagious, um, it is easily, um, I suppose, killed and deactivated by the use of various surface wipes, cleaning, surfactants, and the mouth rinses do a very good job as well. Um, your chlorhexidines, savicols, essential oils, listerines, and even the povidone iodine. Just look at the concentrations, don't have them too strong. Some of the betadine formulations are around 10%, so make sure you're only using a 1% if you're using that as a rinse. Um, um, if you need to do radiographs, I'm quite happy to do that, not a problem. Again, just look at wrapping and shielding for your uh, films or for your uh, sensors um, and the proper technique for, uh, for processing those. Um, local anaesthetics, Definitely you can use those if necessary. You will find that if you're doing a fair bit of the ART dentistry, quite often local anaesthetics aren't required. Um, however, um, please don't do procedures obviously on pulp tissue if patients are gonna need local anaesthetic, you treat the use that as required. Um, but the big key is isolation techniques. And I think we all understand that. I've mentioned it a few times. Um, rubber dam, cotton rolls, high volume suction are critical. Once you've placed rubber dam, your second stage of disinfection is to go in and, and decontaminate or disinfect the operating field. And again, go back to your chlorhexidine, cyanide chloride, peroxide or iodine, and use those to wipe the area. Um, and, and so you're working in a sterile area. One of the advantages of, well, I won't say sterile, but decontaminated area. One of the advantages of this is that it allows you to potentially um, do some uh, rotary cutting um, because you've removed saliva from the area. 
and potentially any aerosols would only be water and, and tooth debris and not actually contain saliva and contamination. But again, just minimise those aerosols. Um, I would suggest you avoid or reduce the ease of an air turbine. Um, if you have a red band handpiece, that might be of an advantage, placing the red band or speed increasing handpiece on your slow speed motor uh, means you can run at a slower speed. Probably the big advantage of that is you can put your friction grip or high speed burrs into that red band handpiece and use it for maybe trimming enamel or removing some of uh, old rest restorative material if necessary. Uh, but again, don't run those at that very high speed because again, you'll not only create an aerosol, but you'll also create a lot of heat. Uh, and always use high volume evacuation. Cotton pellets, um, cotton wool rolls, there's lots of ways of drying preparations. Um, as I said, triple X syringe um, can create quite a significant aerosol, um, particularly if you use the air and water together as a spray. Um, very light water, uh, can be used to irrigate or clean a preparation. The very light air you know, could possibly be used to dry the preparation, but avoid the very strong blasts and avoid using both together. Um, obviously, as I said, you're going to need to treat pulpal symptoms. And then when you restore the tooth, um, we've got a range of great glass ornaments, which I'll try and touch on and, and clarify that a bit more. Um, you are going to need to determine your pulp management, whether you're going to do pulp capping or pulp removal. Um, and the therapeutic medications that you're going to be using. Um, your decision to do an interim or definitive restoration really based is based on minimising the need for an additional appointment for your patient and having something that's going to last, you know, two to three months at a minimum, so that the patient doesn't have to come back. Um, this is a classic example of, of using ART dentistry, um, and it's taken from here in those publication in the British Dental Journal back in 2014. Um, large carious lesion here, um, access is cut and we're going to remove this caries, but it's only peripherally, and we're going to leave that deeper um, area so we don't get a caries exposure. And then restoring that lesion using a high fluoride releasing glass onomer in direct contact with the pulp, and then placing a high strength glass onomer over the top. Now, if you decide you want to use calcium hydroxide or other materials underneath there, that's fine. Um, but there's a fair bit of research which shows that Placing a high fluoride releasing GIC directly onto that deep lesion and then sealing the whole lot in can be very effective in restoring the tooth. Um, if you wanted to use composite resin over the top of this, you can. However, there are some limitations in essence that uh, to get the composite resin to bond appropriately and seal here, you would need to etch your enamel margins. And one of the issues with etchant is washing it off and you need to make sure that uh, you don't create aerosols in washing off that etchant. One of the advantages of making this all glass onomer is you can use the polyacrylic acid um, to condition and remove smear layers and then blot and dry that off with the cotton pellet um, and even if there's a small amount of the uh, residual conditioner left there it won't interfere with the adhesion of your glass onomer uh, because we, as we know the polyacrylic acid is part of the component of the glass onomer. Um, so the conditioning with that is, I think, a good way in going with the all GIC restoration is a good option for these patients. If, however, you decide to put composite and want to etch there, that's well and good. But I would suggest use a very low viscosity etchant. Um, you need to wash that up fully, um, whereas if you're using the conditioner, you can very gently remove those. They've got already a very low viscosity. The very thick gel etchants can be very difficult to remove, but they do need to be fully removed. Um, there's often a bit of confusion about dentine conditioners and cavity conditioners for glass onomers. Uh, look, in general terms, they're both polyacrylic acid. The dentine conditioner is only a 10%, whereas cavity conditioner is 20%. Um, both can be effective for this ART dentistry. If you're using a 10%, apply it for 20 seconds. If you're using the 20%, it's only a 10 second application. The cavity conditioner tends to be a little bit more effective for both enamel and dentine, as opposed to the dentine conditioner, which is mainly for where you're doing selective etching of enamel and then purely dentine conditioning. But in this situation, I think both are, effective, both are okay. So I guess one of the key issues around the ART dentistry and doing non-rotary preparation is the concept of removing only the outer carious infected dentine and leaving the inner affected dentine. Um, now it's not a new concept, it's, a, it's been around for a long time and the whole concept is that you are removing the soft, moist, discoloured dentine, which is full of bugs and it's got no structural value. 
but when you get to that harder underlying surface, even though it might be darkened, it can be left. That so-called affected dentine, um, it, it can repair, it can create a good barrier between the pulp tissue. Um, that soft tissue comes out very easily normally with hand instruments and slowly rotating slow speed burrs. Um, and it's a little bit self-limiting with those slow speed burrs and hand instruments that you actually will stop when you get to the heart of dentine. So you'll find that doing hand instruments and slow rotating slow speed burrs tend to be more conservative and give you good tactile feedback. And of course, there is going to be less or no aerosol associated with that. So situation would be here where you've got deep carious lesion using hand instruments or burrs, you'd remove that soft carious area. Um, hand instruments, you'll find very easily scrape this away, but when they get to the harder material, it doesn't work. It doesn't remove the excess tissue. Um, you are aiming to get that two millimetres of sound margin um, so that you get a good seal. We know that the key to success here is going to be a peripheral seal. Um, just quickly on um, the slow speed burrs, you can get those either as stainless steel or tungsten carbide. You'll note the tungsten carbide are often um, welded to a stainless steel shank. Um, one of the issues with the tungsten carbide slow speeds is they will actually cut uh, sound dentine and even cut enamel. So just be a little aware of which burrs you're using. Um, Generally, the stainless steel burrs are better in that they're going to be self-limiting and not remove too much tooth structure. Um, so uh, the concept is to remove from the periphery downwards, remove the peripheral caries from the dentoenamel junction and work towards the, the pulp. You want to remove any weakened or unsupported enamel with a hand instrument. Um, you don't need to excessively do, remove tooth structure, but it is imperative that you create a good clean margin for a marginal seal with your glass on Use the largest excavator or largest burr that you can get into the cavity. Um, so you can remove that soft tissue, but stop before you get to that pulpal exposure. So it's basically removing from the periphery and working your way down to the base using hand instruments and ensuring you've got that clear periphery. Um, that decision on how much infected dentine to remove is a balance between removing enough dentine to get a favorable bond and seal while maintaining sufficient dentine over the pulp to ensure that you're not going to get the exposure or create pulpal, pulpal um, contamination. Now, again, I, I iterate that this is for your cases of reversible pulpitis. It's really, if you've got irreversible pulpitis, definite pulpal symptoms would be going in and dressing or extirpating the pulp tissue. But for those that are um, reversible pulpitis, hot, cold pain, just get the patient out of discomfort, a very effective technique. Um, and I guess it is that concept of working down towards the center of the tooth. Um, so when you start to see these almost pulpal exposures, you stop. Um, if unfortunately you do get the pulpal exposure, you know you've done that in a reasonably clean environment. You've already removed all the caries rather than going straight through some soft caries into the pulp tissue. At this stage, you either look at pulp capping or pulp extirpation, depending on what you believe is in the best interests of the patient. But there are plenty of uh, good concepts around true pulp capping. Okay, so if you decide to do absolutely no hand pieces, you can actually get kits uh, which are for a, uh, a traumatic restorative treatment. And these kits, uh, the ones from Hufridi in particular, they have a range of instruments for accessing through enamel um, and removing caries. And, and these top two instruments, this is a sharp pointed parabenal um, instrument. That's a four sided pyramid, and this is a three sided pyramid. Very easy for gaining access through uh, softened enamel, and you can widen and expand the cavity. Um, this is an enamel hatchet. Many of you will recall hatchets and chisels, maybe from your undergraduate days for trimming margins. They've tended to disappear in our modern adhesive dentistry, but if you've got some of those in your drawer, get them out, sterilise, get using, uh, because they can be very effective in, in preparing your teeth. And of course, excavators, which we all have. The mechanism or the technique of using these is to place them into the lesion and basically jiggle backwards and forwards and work your way in and create a cavity such that you can then get the excavator in. Um, a lot of people would say it's probably far more efficient and, and quicker just to use a burr um, and provided you do that with no aerosol then maybe that's the case but um, I, there are techniques where you can do preparations with hand instruments only. Um, this is again from some work from here no and he's showing the preparation and the whole concept of getting into the lesion, removing only the enamel that's necessary to get access to the carious area, um, remove that caries uh, which is Infected, leave the affected, place glass on it in direct contact with that, and then restore the tooth. 
this will aid with re re reparative dentine forming, it will maintain the health of the pulp, uh, and then you can restore the occlusal surface of the tooth or the interproximal area with a glass onomer and then trim and shape as necessary. Um, as I said, you can do the surface sealing with composite, but you want to make sure you haven't left a large amount of composite because you'll require some grinding and trimming and aerosol creation to get that back into the occlusion. It is much easier to trim the GIC in its early stages. Again, just for interest, there are techniques for removing caries which um, don't require hand pieces, and some of you may recall the carry sole system. This was a chemical chemico-mechanical uh, technique for removing caries. It relied on a solution of sodium, hydro sodium hypochlorite and amino acids, and that was placed onto the dentine. And a series of hand instruments, which had a range of different shapes, were used to uh, remove the denatured collagen. Um, so this hypochlorite solution broke down the denatured collagen, but didn't break down healthy tooth structure. And that you could gently scrape that material out and blot it out with cotton, roll, uh, cotton pellets and then restore the tooth. Uh, while it's a great idea, it does take a long time. I'm probably not recommending you do this currently. I think hand pieces, um, slow speed burrs, and hand instruments will do just as an effective treatment. But uh, if you have some of this and still use it, it's very effective currently. So what sort of materials do we restore with? Um, I think you've got a range of great products out there. Um, I think in the current restrictions, the use of glass onomers is my go-to material. Um, if you've got smaller cavities, you can use less strong glass onomers. If you've got larger cavities, use the stronger reinforced glass onomers. So in this particular patient, um, you've got a lesion there that's supported by two structure around it. So in this case, some Fuji white was used. In the larger lesion, there's some Fuji 9, which has been used because it's going to be a little bit more um, resistant to fracture. I'm going to talk about the newer material, Equia Fort Fill, as an even stronger material. Um, and the Fuji bulk material, because we have a range of excellent materials that we can use as temporization materials, which will last three, six months, even 12 months in some instances. For root surface caries, deep subgingival caries, I think um, a couple of the materials, the Fuji 7 and Fuji bulk are ideal for this. Um, I'm putting this case in to show you that we can get longevity from even the Fuji 7 EP. This is a, an elder gentleman with, with some root surface lesions. Um, not one to extract a tooth or lose a tooth structure. So some ART dentistry was done to uh, scrape out some of the, the curious lesion and then just fill those up with the uh, Fuji 7. So this is day of placement and we've got three and six month follow-ups of this individual. And, and while you'll see that the Fuji 7 has dissolved to a certain degree, um, it has protected the teeth. Uh, the Fuji 7 has acted as the sacrificial anode. Um, and even though this is an acidic environment and there's lots of risk, um, the glass onoma has protected the adjacent tooth structure. Um, I'll talk a little bit about using Fuji bulk to do a similar thing, but um, we do have some great materials that can be both therapeutic and restorative um, and assist us during, for patients during this period. I'll just briefly diverge into silver fluoride. Um, and again, I apologize to those in New Zealand because I will be aware that the silver fluoride is not available in New Zealand, but certainly in Australia, if you access silver fluoride, it can be a great way of doing uh, stabilization of the gross caries in patients. Um, generally, silver fluoride is applied and left for some time, and then you go back and restore the tooth at a later date. However, there are publications that talk about using uh, silver fluoride and the restoration of glass on them at the same appointment. This concept of silver modified atraumatic restorative treatment or the acronym SMART uh, has often been used as an alternative caries prevention tool. So again, this is very accepted treatment. It is not uh, left field. It is something which is really useful and something you should consider. Um, so the technique would really be that you again, isolate the tooth, you remove the gross caries, and then you apply the uh, silver fluoride um, that will stabilise the lesion to a certain degree uh, and then you can start to trim away and leave some of the silver fluoride treated central caries creating a peripheral seal and you can leave that restoration in place for quite some time and then go back later on. This will quite often uh, reduce the potential for pulpal symptoms, pulpal exposure uh, and particularly in, in uh, older patients root surface caries it is a great way of controlling it. Um, there are a couple of different forms of silver fluoride available in Australia. This 
first version Black Diamond from Creighton Dental. Um, it's a mix of 40% silver fluoride and 10% stannous fluoride. It is not an ammoniated version um, and it is an aqueous solution. You apply the silver fluoride first followed by the stannous fluoride. It does turn the teeth quite black um, and generally when you look at this you will see that everything looks uh, not that attractive. Generally you would leave this several weeks to a month and then come back and prep the teeth because you get a much better preparation margin. Um, unfortunately, prepping the tooth while you've got active caries like this, you tend to do um, over preparation and risk damage and there's often a fair bit of gingival inflammation. If you can place the silver fluoride and come back several weeks later, it's fine. Under our current restrictions, we'd be really trying to do this all at the one visit, um, although both are possible. Alan Deutsch has published a great deal of information on this and particularly with the elder patients, particularly for subgingival lesions, where he does very little removal of the surface, places the silver fluoride, cuts back to a clean margin and the glass on or over the top of it. And these can last for many, many years and he's got follow up of a lot of cases on this. So, so please don't discount this as a good option for some of our high care risk patients. The other form of silver fluoride is the ammoniated version, the diamine silver fluoride. Um, and this is the product from Reva Star. Um, there are two capsules, one containing the silver fluoride ammonia solution, the silver one, and the green one contains potassium iodide. And the potassium iodide will precipitate out the uh, silver and you get a white precipitate. Um, and then you continue to place the potassium iodide until that goes clear. And then you can place your glass on directly on top. One of the risks with this product though is it's got a very high pH and there is potential for gingival burning. So uh, just be a little careful in its use, but it can be ideal for these very bad gross caries cases where you're wanting to just stabilize and not do any definitive treatment until a later date. Um, and if you're doing visits in nursing homes or helping people, it can be a great lifesaver in terms of what we can do for those patients. But I guess the whole idea is it's all about disease control and stabilization removing the caries, restoring with high fluoride releasing glass onomers. And I will point out that people often say that they want to use tooth colored glass onomers. I would prefer using the white and pink versions because it acts as a great marker for the patient and say so that's where you need to clean your teeth better. Um, it will also encourage them to come back and get some more definitive treatment done at a later date. So uh, I think that there are some big benefits in, in the colors in these restorative materials. I mentioned Fiji Bulk a couple of times. It is uh, very much one of my go-to materials these days um, because of the fact that it's got very low solubility. So for this particular patient, um, fractured root surface here, lots of caries, um, you know, rather than try to do an extraction here or do something complex here, minimally invasive treatment using ART means we can carefully clean this out, place the Fuji bulk, and because of its rapid set, and ease of trimming, you know, very quickly within two minutes, you could be trimming this up and shaping it up and having the patient out of the chair. Um, because of the low solubility, that's not gonna have washout like some of the other glass onomers, it's gonna be more protective. Um, it doesn't have high level aesthetics, but it's not required in these situations. Um, so why would you use this rather than the Fuji 7? The Fuji 7 is a very high fluoride releasing product, but it will dissolve very rapidly. The Fuji Bulk has very low solubility, um, it doesn't have um, anywhere near a significant amount of fluoride release, but what it does instead is it actually acts to neutralize acids, intrinsic and extrinsic and plaque acids um, and stops the dissolution. So these therapeutic materials work in a slightly different mechanism and you can determine which is going to be more appropriate to your uh, individual patient. Um, there is uh, plenty of literature showing that um, the Fiji bulk has got very low solubility. Uh, and this is a, a fairly clear example of a composite placed next to a tooth where you're in an acid environment and the tooth structure will dissolve because the composite provides no protection. Some glass onomers, if you place them, you will get dissolution of the glass onomer and protection of the enamel. One of the big advantages of Fuji bulk is you don't get dissolution of the Fuji bulk and you get protection of the enamel. Um, and that's borne out by looking at a range of different glass onomers. And I won't go through all of this, but you're either gonna lose restorative material or you're gonna lose or demineralize enamel. And the Fuji bulk as shown really is probably one of the best in terms of protecting enamel and dentine and not dissolving. So, um, you know, out of interest, that product was particularly developed for the Australian New Zealand markets where we do so many open sandwich restorations, but it has so many other uses for the high carriers with patients. So I've mentioned Fuji 7 a lot. Um, you're probably aware there are the two versions, the original Fuji 7 and the EP. 
version, which contains the CBP, ACP. And uh, that means you've got some calcium and phosphate release, which is ideal for our low saliva patients and our dry mouth patients. I mean, both are good. I routinely would go to using the Fuji 7 EP. It still comes in the white and the pink, and it's a very good long-term material for deciduous teeth or patients where you want to control an active carious lesion. Um, I think also you might want to consider using stainless steel crowns. Um, for deciduous teeth, uh, often composites and glass onomers can get some caries around them, particularly in an active carious mouth. Um, bonding a stainless steel crown on with Fuji 7 is an ideal way of controlling this uh, to a later date. Um, again, sometimes these might be simple enough to do an extraction on, and for gross caries, that may be the better option for a deciduous tooth. Uh, but if you're requiring space maintenance, then a stainless steel crown cemented with Fuji 7 would be probably my go-to. So I know there's a lot of materials out there and, and there's lots of different options. I, I think we need to be aware that uh, you don't need every glass on them there, but you do need to have a restorative material and you need to have therapeutic materials. Um, I would probably minimise these and suggest that you move to something like the Equia Fort Fill as your high strength restorative and the Fuji 7 as the high fluoride releasing and Fuji Bulk as your um, low solubility acid protecting agent. Um, there are leaflets and instructions on all these materials which are freely downloadable from the GC website uh, or your GC representatives will be able to forward those on to you should you want them. Um, but they basically give really good information on indications, how long you've got to manipulate them, how long before you can get them wet and how long before you can finish them. So really excellent information which shows us that we have a range of materials which are ideally suited to our restorative dentistry during this difficult time. I have created this little table which is a little bit of a suggestion of how you determine what's the most important property to you. Is it fluoride release, solubility, aesthetics, strength, radio opacity? Um, and in that table, put the various glass onomers. I won't focus on that. Um, I will tell you that all of these slides are available um, and they can be sent to you if necessary and you can take your time and look at those at a later date should you want to. Okay, let's quickly move on to the fractured or lost restoration. Um, and again, I mentioned before that you can either smooth it over or you can restore it with a temporary. Uh, again, the same as before, radiographs, isolation, local anaesthetic, minimally invasive preparation. But in these indications, I would suggest you use one of the high strength glass onomers such as the um, Equia Fort Fill, um, because it will give you a much longer term restoration. There is the potential to go back and use some silver amalgam. And if you've got enough mechanical retention, I'm not gonna discount it. Uh, I'm thinking composites probably not ideal because of the need to etch and potentially create aerosols and then do trimming, which creates aerosol. However, I'm not, it, it can still be used. You can still use composites if you consider that it's best to your situation and using appropriate uh, high volume evacuation, all excellent. Some of the new high strength injectables are very good because you can get good wetting, good contact and good shaping. Um, and you can get excellent results with those as well. But generally speaking, fractured teeth, I would still be recommended using glass onomers. Um, certainly you can smooth that over. If it's no symptoms, patient can keep that clean, stop it being a food trap, or alternatively restore it with a large GIC. I would still recommend that you use a matrix band to create a good contact point. Um, However, there are circumstances where you might just simply want to place this to seal up an area and protect it. And I thought I'd just indicate this is a case that uh, was treated without any preparation at all. It was a patient that, that quickly had some glass on and placed over some fractured teeth and left as it was. Uh, and then we've got three and six month follow up of that patient showing that the glass on can be quite effective using the Equia Fort Fill. One of the issues we've got here is that if you do bond to the adjacent tooth, it's probably going to fracture. Um, so if you are going to do this without a matrix band, I suggest you put some lubricant, uh, um, cocoa butter Vaseline on the adjacent tooth, just so it doesn't bond to the adjacent tooth. But uh, it just shows flexibility and versatility of our glass onomers. So in moving from our Fuji 9s through the Equia 4 fill, we have created a stronger material. And then on top of that, we can coat that with the Equia Fort coat to make it even more fracture resistant and tough. Um, there is more and more literature coming out that glass onomers can be used as a permanent restorative in smaller class one and class two cavities. And if we look at some of the testing that's been done, and I just want you to remember this number here, this 257 newtons. Now, 
compared to other glass onomers, the Equia 4 bill is becoming much stronger. Um, and it has got the strength very close to a microfill composite. Now, I don't want to give you a physics lesson early on a Tuesday, but um, if you think about um, force equals mass by acceleration, you take an apple, uh, accelerated by gravity, you get one Newton. That Newton applied over a surface area gives us a megapascal. And we often talk about forces in megapascals, which are to do with bond strengths and fracture of restoration. It is possible to measure those occlusal forces on a range of patients. And literature and research has showed us that in children, particularly preschool children, uh, maximal occlusal bite force is very rarely above 250 newtons. So we know that in our children, that the equia fort bill is going to be very effective and it's highly unlikely to be broken in those patients. As people get older and into adulthood, then certainly some of these may fracture. But then again, as patients get older, you note that that bite force starts to drop again, particularly in our uh, frail elderly. And again, bite forces are rarely above 250 newtons. So I think our Equia Fort Fill is a very effective material in some particular patients and in smaller lesions. Um, and comparatively, composite resins are in the range of 250 to 350 megapascal strength. So um, we do have composites and glass onomers at the lower end here, um, very similar in their performance. So don't discount glass onomers. They are, I think it's fair to say that glass onomers should no longer be considered purely as a temporary material. Their properties and abilities have increased enormously um, in recent years. And then there is one further plus with our Equia Fort Fill is if you use it in combination with the surface coating, the Equia Fort Coat, you can further increase its strength. The concept here is that you are doing a micro lamination. You are placing a surface sealant over the glass onomer. This is work originally done with the G Coat Plus. The newer version is the Equia Fort Coat. Um, this microlamination technique fills surface voids, bubbles and cracks and creates a much tougher surface. And you will get up to a 30% increase in strength um, going with the Equia Fort Fill. And this is just showing some flexural strength of Fuji 9 Equia Fort Fill. And if you're going to increase your flexural strength and your fracture toughness by around 30%, it's going to be much more durable and last much better. Um, and while the Equia Fort coat can be placed over all glass onomers, it is specifically designed to work with the Equia Fort fill. Um, it also acts as a bit of a barrier and, and does interfere with fluoride release and, and acid neutralization. So it's probably not recommended to use the coat over your Fuji 7 and Fuji Bulk, but over the Equia Fort fill, it makes an exceptionally strong restoration. And also have a bit of consideration about the shape of your interproximal restorations. Use appropriate matrix bands. Um, Keep them contoured, don't make them flat. Again, there's a lot of literature which would show that you can get significantly stronger marginal ridges uh, up to another 50% increase by creating the appropriate interproximal contour because the forces are distributed along the curve rather than the straight line and increases the fracture. So, so I guess we're moving, there's a range of great materials out there. If you've been a Fuji 9 user, great, still use it. Fuji 9 Extra is a great product. However, a little bit of solubility. Equia Fort Fill we know is a much stronger material and the, and the Fuji Bulk are great for low solubility, but aesthetics not as good. Um, I know a lot of people still like the Fuji 2LC, a tremendous product for aesthetics. Um, but again, the fact that it requires light for polymerization means that it's not really indicated in very large cavities. It's more for the class fives and more aesthetic areas that you might want to place it in. So, so I'm gonna summarize that all up by saying that I think, you know, atraumatic restorative, treatment um, and adapted techniques uh, do provide us with some great treatment options currently to provide some dentistry for our patients during this pandemic period. They are definitely minimally invasive and low risk and in most cases non-threatening and painless for our patients. They're definitely aerosol free. They can be very efficient and effective while still being very economical to deliver to our patients. What I would also state that using art and getting used to using ART dentistry now does enhance your armamentarium into the future. And it's going to be effective, not just in this period in time, but also effective as being mainstream when we move out of periods of restrictions. Um, and I think you don't need to feel restricted because you have a range of great adhesive materials that can be used with an ART approach. Um, even if you do want to use composite resins, um, using self-etching primers and adhesives rather than using etchants can be a way of extending some of our restorative materials. So. Um, Please don't feel restricted. Um, if you're continuing to do dentistry, there's still a lot that you can do. Um, I know I've covered a lot there.